uh, typical uh, 7 o'clock start. So um, we've called the order and uh, we're starting with uh, public comment for anyone who wants to present something to the council that's not on the agenda. So our typical public comment, not on the agenda type comments. Uh, if there's anybody here that would like to speak to the, to the council. And I don't see anybody rushing for the podium, so um, that takes us to item three, which is uh, the public hearing. And uh, by the way, if anybody's curious why we're not starting with our typical tradition of pledge and so forth, we'll do that at 7 o'clock. So um, this is more of a study session, if you will. All right, uh, so we're starting out with the public hearing, and uh, Mr. Maltby. Oh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Jeff Maltby, City Manager. Uh, as we uh, embark on our journey this evening, I thought I'd make a few uh, comments and provide a little bit of overview before we start turning it over to the number of uh, consultants and experts and uh, uh, the folks from CM Trans and their property department to talk to you as well this evening. So tonight's public hearing is to provide the city council and the public with information and provide the opportunity to hear from and ask questions of the experts for the final EIR. This is basically the same process that was conducted with the Planning Commission over the last couple of months. The City Council will conduct a public hearing and, and will eventually consider a motion on whether or not to certify the final EIR. And specifics of those motions and whatnot will be provided to you uh, as part of the process later on. We're not anticipating that uh, you'll be arriving there within the next two hours. Uh, anyway, and possibly not even at all this evening. In addition, the City Council may also wish to consider a motion to give the project applicant further direction on the proposed project as part of a list of improvement measures which will guide the project later in the process as it goes through the entitlement phase, which is similar to what the Planning Commission did as they addressed the project. The staff report before you does contain uh, uh, one significant option, an option that um, has been brought up uh, before in terms of phasing the EIR and the entitlement work. Uh, the project's been on a two-phase track since 2007 when the application was submitted to the city. Phase one is for the uh, uh, final uh, environmental impact review certification. The CEQA is a state law, which is a very complex uh, set of requirements that are often uh, different from a city's regulatory process and preferences regarding its own uh, built environment. Environmental impact reports include any number of specific and often complex reports and evaluations from experts ranging from traffic engineers to noise specialists to biologists and toxic professionals. Uh, many of which you will hear from uh, this evening. Considering the, the EIR along with the design and permits for a project of this scale uh, can be very complicated, which why in 2007 uh, it was decided uh, along with the City Council that this was going to be a two-phase EIR and then entitlement process. And that's where we are today. With the two-phase process, which is allowed under CEQA, the project entitlements uh, or actual design can be considered separately and, and given the necessary focus. Uh, in phase one, the Planning Commission and the City Council are focusing their attention on the EIR uh, first, and then in phase two, the Planning Commission and the City Council will focus on the project design, which primarily will consider things like height and massing, architectural design, and other elements that, uh, that we actually hear a lot about uh, from the public but aren't necessarily related uh, specifically to the, uh, the EIR process. The Planning Commission would hold public hearings on entitlements expected in the spring of 2013. The Planning Commission recommendation on certification of the uh, final environmental review document, which is before you this evening, uh, the PD uh, zoning, the, the plan development zoning, I should say, plan development plan and tentative map if required, would return to the City Council all next year. 
As an alternate to this, the City Council could conduct a public hearing on the EIR and consider the Planning Commission recommendations and not take action tonight on certifying the EIR and rather provide direction and guidance to staff and the Planning Commission to proceed with the entitlement uh, process. That would be an option. It's not one that's recommended by the staff this evening. Uh, I think you'd probably want to hear from the um, project sponsors as well on that issue before you made a determination. Uh, my feeling on that option is that uh, both supporters and opponents to the project uh, would like to see the city and the council begin to deal with issues that they feel affect uh, their neighborhood or their interest in the project one way or the other. And really primarily the ability to do that is going to be in the entitlement process, uh, we believe. I believe that having spent a good deal of time with a number of various stakeholders uh, in this project. In terms of tonight's meeting, uh, the mechanics, the schedule from 5 to 7 will focus on technical presentations. And uh, should we finish the presentations, we'll begin with questions and answers from the City Council of the folks that have been presenting to you. Uh, later in the evening, following the start of the regular meeting and consideration of another item, the Council may begin to take uh, public testimony once all your uh, questions are answered. We would open the public hearing. Uh, tonight is the Council's first public hearing on the final environmental impact report, and there may be more meetings, as many as the Council uh, deems necessary before uh, the Council uh, decides to take an action on the uh, environmental impact report. Following the public hearing, the Council may wish to consider whether or not to consider the recommendation from the Planning Commission regarding certification of the EIR. <clears throat> so the role of the City Council in the environmental review is to conduct a public hearing and after considering all the public comments and documents including the uh, fire, final environmental impact report and prior to approving the project decide whether or not to certify the final environmental impact report document as adequate in accordance with California Environmental Quality uh, Act. I think that's an important statement and distinction. Uh, I think uh, uh, the city may decline to certify the EIR and request further analysis uh, if uh, in its judgment certification of the EIR would not comply with the requirements of CEQA. But this is a study. This is not the project. And I'd like to, to reiterate that. Certification of the final environmental impact report uh, would not commit the City Council to a specific course of action with regard to the project. CEQA state law requires that this city conduct an analysis, an environmental impact analysis, to be in compliance with state law in regards to the project. You have, we have as a city, an obligation to do this and provide this level of study. In the end, providing the study is an obligation. Approving the project is not, and it's important to make that distinction, I think, for, for some folks who are new to the land use process who get involved with these projects. It can be confusing to them in terms of uh, how an environmental impact document uh, is considered, put together, reviewed, what it actually means. Uh, it's very infrequent that you see an environmental impact report document that isn't approved. but. That's not to say that it's infrequent that projects aren't approved. So in other words, there are many projects who have environmental impact report documents approved, but later aren't the entitlement project is not approved by the council, uh, but it does have a certified EIR. That's more typical than seeing an EIR that's just out and out rejected. Typically, you'd just be sending it back for more study. So that's a little bit of background. That's where we're going. I'll turn the mic over to our first presenter tonight to get things started. Unless you have any quick questions of myself or the city attorney, we'll be here to answer anything as you'd like. You can jump in or hold your questions to the end. Any questions? None? Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the council. Mr. Mayor, I'm Mark Simon, executive officer 
Public Affairs for Sam Trans. I wasn't sure it was me speaking because he referred to experts. Uh, in addition to me being here, we have a couple of key staff members here who can also answer quite a number of questions. Brian Fitzpatrick, who's the manager of our real estate program, and Seamus Murphy, who is in charge of uh, community relations and government affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this project uh, and explain uh, some of the reasons why Sam Trans hired Legacy to pursue this project. Um, it is an important uh, transit-oriented development project, and Sam Trans, as a matter of policy, is committed to transit-oriented development as a means of um, improving upon the community, providing an opportunity to do that, as a means of revenue for Sam Trans, and as a demonstration of the value of transit-oriented development. Um, we estimate we will get somewhere slightly below a million dollars in revenue from this lease should it go forward as it's currently constructed. Uh, customers, people who are determined to adopt a lifestyle that is adjacent to transit will find this an appealing project. It is an ideal location for transit-oriented development. It's next to a major transit station that receives robust train and bus service and it is in walking distance to downtown San Carlos, one of the most vibrant suburban downtowns in the Bay Area. It is a true synergy and a true demonstration of what TOD can be. And if SamTrans doesn't demonstrate the value of this, then who will? We think it's an, we have an obligation to be a model for this kind of development. So as a matter of policy, that's why we engage Legacy. Uh, we issued an RFP uh, some years ago. We got several bids, several proposals, and we selected Legacy because we found Legacy to be the most sensitive, uh, the most thoughtful about how to do this, they had the right um, understanding. It was, to be frank, not the biggest project that was proposed among all those that were. Uh, so we made a conscious decision to choose a project that we thought fit best, uh, and that came from Legacy. A number of questions have been asked about Old County Road, and I thought I might as well just address that issue head on, and then I'm available for any other questions. Uh, we will seek to avoid any impact that this project or future Caltrain or high-speed rail projects have on Old County Road to the extent that we can. We do not expect that there will be such a project, but we can't be certain any more than anybody else can about what kind of configuration uh, might be required for four tracks in this area and whether or not four tracks might even be needed in this area. At our requirement, high-speed rail has prepared an aerial alternative that does not impact Old County Road. At, so it already has been demonstrated that this can be done. That's our intent. Uh, one of the requirements contained in the agreement with Legacy is that the project be built in such a manner is such a, so that there is room for, for the right-of-way to expand westward should it be necessary. The fact is there is enough room within the right-of-way currently to accommodate four tracks. We were asked uh, at the Planning Commission, one of the questions they raised was whether or not it was possible, given our relative certainty on this issue, or we could somehow ensure or bond against any future significant impact on Old County Road. Uh, we asked both our legal counsel and our uh, insurance uh, broker to investigate this issue, uh, and they did so thoroughly. Um, simply put, it's not an insurable risk. Uh, there's generally not available in the insurance market something that could insure against this. And in no event can Sam Trans obtain coverage for liabilities related to what another agency is doing or might do. Um, that being said, we were happy to participate in some several facilitated meetings with uh, residents of the greater East San Car Eastern San Carlos area to try and address some of their concerns, um, try and reassure them about some of the facts they've heard, and um, clarify some of the other things they'd heard. We, uh, we participated, I forgot how many sessions there were, Brian. Four or five, right? Yeah, um, and we were happy to do so. Uh, we thought that we had a very good conversation. One of the things we discussed there and committed to doing is considering language in the regional MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding. There's a nine agency MOU between the funding partners that, that addresses the future of Caltrain electrification, modernization, and high-speed rail, and we agreed like a number of other cities, that this would be an appropriate venue for attempting to address this question. This is not the only community 
It has concerns about the future of high-speed rail and its impact on major roadways adjacent to the right-of-way. So this is an appropriate place to do that. The, the process of reviving and re, I'm sorry, revising, <laughs> revising the MOU has just begun. It will include an extensive amount of public outreach and community outreach. So this will certainly be one of the places where this would, should be considered. Uh, I want to conclude, and I'm, I hope I haven't gone too high level, too fast. Um, we want to be good citizens in San Carlos. This is San Trans's home. Uh, we participated in the facilitation process, even though we believe it is the responsibility of a legacy to address the majority of issues facing this project as the developer who's going to entitle this project. That doesn't mean we absolve ourselves of responsibility. We think we take our responsibility seriously, and we hope we've demonstrated that. So we think we've chosen um, a developer who is the best and the right one for this project, sensitive to the community, effective at this kind of development, the right developer to continue to demonstrate how Samtrans can be a good partner to this city. Happy to address any questions or turn it over to somebody who actually uh, might be better to answer. Questions for Mr. Simon? Up. A couple of questions, Mark. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that Samtrans is going to lease, in other words, um, you're not going to sell the property, you're no. going to basically... Samtrans retains ownership of the property in perpetuity. Okay. And you, you said that you gave an amount of a million dollars in revenue, is that per year? No. No, it's over the life of the lease. And that would be over uh, years? 65 years with two 17-year options. So basically, it, it, it's about 100,000. Is that right? No. It's per, per year. Yeah. Per year. It is per year. Excuse me. Well, no, we've already reached the limit of my co uh, capacity. That's here. okay, because if it was 100000 a year, I'd say I'll, I'll do something with you specifically and give you 100000 bucks. You'll give us $100,000 a year? Sure, for that property, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I get uh, this. Nine, about $900,000 a year. Okay, sorry, so it's basically going to be nine per year. Right. Okay. And the third question I had, a uh, quick question, is um, you talked about the impact on Old County Road relative to the, you know, if the trains, you know, if high-speed rail or whatever else, but specifically, and I know it's in the in the in the uh, staff report, but just for the record, specifically, you don't. Uh, you know, Old County Road is not going to be used as a staging area or any kind of basically storage area if if and when this project got approved and the building started. Everything would be on the other side, on the El Camino side. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Questions? Before we go on with questions, uh, if I may. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know we started at five. Some of you are probably hungry. You came straight from work to here. So the city has saw fit to uh, be a good host and provide you food out out there. So uh, feel free to get up and, and go get something to eat if you like. Uh, that's fine. And uh, can they bring the food in here? You can bring the food in here. Just try to be mindful of your neighbors, where you're sitting and so forth. But it, this, again, is a bit of a different venue than we typically have for council meetings. So um, it's a little bit more relaxed. That's why we have Mark Simon here. So, Because we're more relaxed. That's right. I'm happy to accommodate in any way I can. <laughs> OK, uh, questions more from the dice? Actually, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to ask sort of a procedural question. I, was, I had organized my questions basically to just ask them at the end of all of the technical presentations and let whichever responder wanted to respond to them. Um, uh, I probably could go through and parse them up differently, but that would take a fair amount of time. Is that okay? I mean, I, I have no problem with people asking questions as we yeah. go through. It's just I'm holding my questions to the end, basically. And, and that's fine, because they're all going to stay here, and they can get up right. and down. They uh, can use the if exercise. Want, Mr. Mayor, yeah. we yeah. can do that. I, I just, no, no, if you want to do that, we'll wait them all to the end. It's fine. I, I would rather leave it to the council member on how they feel okay. comfortable, okay. because some people... Uh, you know, we're getting older and we can't remember the questions if we don't ask them right away. So, me, are you? No, I was looking over this way. So. It's a lot like trying to remember how much the lease is worth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do we have questions over here? Uh, I think I'm probably going to hold my questions. I, I have several questions that uh, I suspect may be answered along the way, and then I may come up with others. So I think it's probably wise to just wait. Very good. Yes, I have a, a, one question. I'm interested in knowing what other parcels of property Sam Trans has its similar to this one in other cities along the peninsula. Are there others? Yeah, there are two other projects that we're currently working on in one fashion or another. Um, Hayward Park in San Mateo. We've just designated a developer to, with whom to negotiate for that project. And in Daly City, there's a uh, Daly City Coma BART station. There's a uh, piece of property there that we're anticipating in a similar fashion being uh, seeking a developer. 
But other other properties that are currently developed are also owned by Samtrans along this the This is our railroad first one. This is our model home. Okay. We but are there other businesses that are that are leasing space along the the railroad corridor that are still owned? I'm sorry. Are there people I, I who I'm, occupy are there businesses that occupy the Yes, I, I'm right interested away? in properties yes. that are not currently being developed. So you do have other sure. other property. Okay. Yeah. All right. And approximately what percentage of of the agency's income is derived from property leases? Um, I'm not sure we can put a number like that on it, to be honest with you. But we can look it up and figure it out for you. I, I was just curious how this fit into what you're currently doing and what your, your future strategy is for if the If the agency. question is whether or not we anticipate this as a major source of revenue, it's, you know, $900,000 a year is not insignificant, but we have a, Samtrans has a $120 million a year operating budget. so. It's, it's an important thing for us to do long term, not so much for the revenue it generates, but the customers it generates and the nature of the community <coughs> and our participation in it as the community evolves. Thank you. So I've, I've got one question. I don't, I don't know if you'll be the one to answer it or, or some, perhaps somebody else, but um, d my question is, does the... Uh, I'm trying to think what the name of the law was. I remember I didn't bring my EIR -E with me, and it's in my notes in there. But um, there was a California state law that established the uh, rail authorities, essentially, back in, I think it was 1861. Um, does that apply to Samtrans and the rail corridor here? And, and <laughs> I, I guess that's Union Pacific as well? Well, I mean, if you go back far right? enough, it was, it was the railroad that was built the preceded Southern Pacific, which was the San Jose San Francisco Railroad mm -hmm. that acquired was acquired by Southern Pacific. That's the entity from which Caltrain ultimately acquired the right of way. Um, I, I'm not sure I can answer uh, the question. I'm certainly not familiar with the legislation you're referring to. What I can tell you is that Caltrain owns the right of way, um, and we're not uh, we're not subject to eminent domain. Uh, if we uh, deem what's appropriate for the right of way. That's what is deemed to be appropriate. And one of the questions that came up during some of the facilitated sessions is Caltrain can promise all it wants to, but what if high-speed rail or somebody just simply decides to do what it wants on the right-of-way? And the answer is it cannot. Caltrain owns the right-of-way. We hold it in trust for the people we serve and the communities we represent. So, so Caltrain owns the right-of-way, yes. but you don't know if they operated under... Uh, the conditions of the 1861 yeah, rail I, law. Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what law you're referring to. I apologize. Okay. The, just to let you. So the, the the reason I ask about that, I did. Like I said, I went through and I read, uh, scanned through it and read in detail parts and pieces of it. And the gist of it is that uh, if you go that far back, uh, land was given to to the railroads to run railroads. And it talks very specifically with uh, shall type language that you know they, they shall put their rail bed in the center of this uh, property. That what was interesting to uh, in reading it is uh, most of the property given to the railroads was given to the railroads for their use. It's not an easement. It's their property, right. but it does have constrictions on it that it must be used for a, ra a railroad and the types of buildings that would be required to run a railroad, including a yard, including depots and, and, and such. Um, and that seemed to be, when you read through it, that's the first and foremost priority. And the reason I bring it up and what I, why I'm curious about it is because of this issue with uh, if high-speed rail does come through and uh, does need more land, and then the concern of the east side regarding Old County Road and, and things impinging Old County Road or even closing Old County Road and yet we can't give any assurances that that won't happen. I hear what you're saying that that's the intent but when you look at the California Rail Law uh, as it was originally written like I said everything was written as the rail shall stay in this on these properties and not uh, go anywhere else unless cities want to sell pieces of parcels to create intersections or, or uh, fl uh, flyaway tracks or, or such. Um, so it's just that's why I ask it because I'm curious about that. Uh, I'm, you've read more about rail law than I have, certainly. I, yeah. The, the only part of this I can respond to, I suppose, is that I can state unequivocally that the proposal that we're uh, 
we're here sponsoring is fully in accord with all current railroad regulations. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right. Who do we have next? <coughs> Commissioners and Mary Excuse me, your name again? Uh, Sherry Scott with Christiani Johnson Architects. And so what I'd like to do is um, give you a brief kind of overview of the architectural aspects of the project. Um, I think my role in the architecture will have more weight when we get to the entitlement phase, phase two. Um, so the intent of this presentation is to um, show the architecture of the project that was studied as part of the EIR, so you have the background um, as the project was originally designed. <coughs> this first slide shows really the civic center of the project, which is the existing historic depot, um, which is really the, the, the show point for, um, the, the, is the train station, it's a, a landmark in the city, and it's also a focal point for the retail component of the project. The intention of the, the retail component of the project was um, to really frame this building. Um, the project does, does this in several ways. It actually steps back in plan, and I'll show you the plans in the next slide. So it flanks uh, in plan, and it also steps up in elevation away from the existing depot. Um, one of the other functional things that it does is it really changes the car circulation um, and turns this into a pedestrian plaza in front of the depot. So it can really be a space that's inhabited. It can be a space that um, there could be some outdoor dining, there could be book fairs, uh, wine events, what have you. You can imagine the space actually being occupied and inhabited by people rather than by cars as it is now. Really, it's pretty much a, a drop off, a turning lane for buses as it is now. It's a confusing intersection. Um, it's difficult to cross as a pedestrian now. So. Um, this is one of the, the major focal points of the project that we'll be um, addressing as part of the design. So the project in its entirety has uh, six residential buildings, uh, four of which are north of Holly, total of 280 units, and it's a combination of one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, building seven and eight are the two retail buildings that we were just showing you in the initial rendering that flank the historic depot. And um, they provide a total of about 36,000 square feet of retail slash office uses on uh, the ground floor, second and third floors. Uh, parking spaces for the residential buildings are underneath each building. So each building parks itself with a partially below grade garage. Um, and then there's some surface parking as well. Uh, also as part of the project, is, uh, we're relocating the parking for Caltrain that's um, around the depot now and shifting it further south and that is being replaced at a one-to-one -one relationship to what they have now. So this is the first part of the site plan. Um, Holly Street is on your right. El Camino is the street address for the project. The Caltrain berm is here, and on the east side is Old County Road with the eastern neighborhoods <coughs> beyond that. Um, the intention in organizing this project was, um, it, it's a long linear site, is to break this down into smaller buildings, smaller spaces that are um, a better pedestrian scale for El Camino Real. There's several things that we did to break down the massing of these buildings and create a nice experience for a pedestrian walking along El Camino Real en route to the uh, transit station. Um, each of the buildings is a, is a courtyard building, so each building is, is U-shaped to uh, collect around an interior courtyard. This creates uh, a little bit of privacy from the units facing the courtyard, both from El Camino Real. It has fewer units facing um, the residents on the east side. Um, it also breaks down the mass of the building, uh, building one, building two, three, and four. So it's not just one continuous bar of, of a building. It's actually broken down um, by stepping in and out from the street. Uh, one thing that was done as part of the design process was to move all of the building lobbies uh, to enter directly off of El Camino Real. Um, initially, we have surface parking between buildings one and two and between buildings three and four. Um, we initially had lobbies off of these parking areas uh, just as a functional constraint. Um, but as part of the planning process and then part of 
working with the city's design review uh, consultant, the, the intent really became to activate the street as much as possible. So we have the building lobbies addressing El Camino. We also have uh, individual stoops for units facing El Camino Real as well. So as much as we can, we're activating the street uh, for pedestrians and making this uh, much more of a green, uh, wide sidewalk, pleasant place to be on your way to the train station and to downtown San Carlos. Now this is the second part of the site plan. Holly Street is now on your left and we're heading further south. This is the historic depot here. Buildings seven and eight are the retail buildings that flank uh, the depot. And as you can see, they step back and plan as well as an elevation as I showed you in the, the previous rendering. Um, to the north of that are, are the two uh, residential buildings, five and six. Again, there's parking for the residential buildings underneath those buildings. Uh, there's surface parking here for the retail. Uh, the first parking here is also reserved for retail, and then the Caltrain parking is, is beyond. Um, you can see in the elevation below, we go from four stories down to three stories, down to two stories, and then back up again um, to step down and up with the scale of the depot. Another major um, improvement that we hope that this project brings is really to try to connect the east side to the west side at this at the depot location. Um, right now, driving along Old County Road, it's it's really difficult to tell that you've actually arrived anywhere. Um, I know there's a lot of um, complaints about the pedestrian circulation across Old County. It's difficult, to, even with a light crossing there. Um, I think cars often speed through here. So we want to change the paving pattern here and really tie this to a new paving pattern that's also on the west side so that as you progress from the east side to the west side, it's a safer experience for pedestrians and um, it visually connects the east to the west in a way that it doesn't now. Again, by turning this into a pedestrian plaza, I think the, the circulation path for pedestrian coming through this area is also nicer because you're really protected um, all the way to the curb at El Camino instead of crossing several lanes of um, pulling in and pulling out and in buses the way it stands now. And this is a detail of the crosswalk here. Um, enhanced paving connections on the east side and on the west side and a habitable pedestrian plaza. The Caltrain parking, this is the furthest south uh, portion of the site, is shifted further south. And again, this is uh, replaced the parking that was taken from the residential buildings and the retail buildings further north. As part of this process, we um, have had several meetings with the uh, residents on the east side, Greater East San Carlos, and um, they have concerns about our project from a view perspective and from a height perspective. And so in talking with them, we've organized our, the grid of our buildings, the layout of our buildings, to relate to the eastern street grid. Um, so between buildings three and four is where our surface parking is here. So looking down, um, Springfield, you actually see a wide open uh, break between the two buildings. Similarly at Sylvan is the, the pool <coughs> courtyard. Um, so again, there's a, a visual break aligning with that street. Um, at Inverness, the building steps down to two stories at this location. And um, at Riverton, it steps down to three stories at this location. So in addition to stepping down at height, we're pulling back in plan as well, particularly at buildings one and two where we weren't able to have a wide open break between the two buildings. We've actually increased the setback um, at these locations. So in addition to stepping down to three stories here, we've pulled back an additional 11 and 14 feet. Similarly at building two, going down to two stories here, we've pulled back an additional 11 and 14 feet. This is the view of the project from the east side, from Old County Road. And the intention here is to keep the architecture consistent with the west side. Um, there's no back side to this project. This project is visible from all sides, especially with the train. And so the intent is to use uh, similar roof forms, similar building massing as we have on the west side. Um, even though most of the residential units do face the west or face internal courtyards, um, the intention is to have this residential building appear residential from both sides and not just one side. So we have a variety of roof forms with trellises. We have exterior walkways. Uh, we do have a few units that do face um, the east side. Um, but all in all, what we're striving for is a variety of roof forms, uh, building breaks 
that align with the street grid. In addition, um, we have robust planting on the berm, and this is both on the east side of the berm, which is um, on the Old County Road side, uh, where we are permitted to on the west side of the berm. Um, this was studied extensively with the Caltrans engineers to see how much tree planting we could have along this stretch and not interfere with the um, uh, performance of the train, with the operation of the train. Um, since then, we've heard that uh, the neighbors want even more planting. So what we've been doing since then is, uh, and we're still in the study process of this, is redesigning actually on the property uh, the EVA lane, which is emer emergency vehicle access, uh, to provide even more planting, actually within the project boundary, to provide a third layer of trees. And I think we're having some, some good headway there. We've met with the fire department. And it looks like we will be able to reduce the amount of emergency vehicle access here and increase and provide that third layer of trees. <coughs> These are some detailed views of um, the step down and the building massing in plan. This is the 11 and 14 foot setback here, in addition to the regular setback that we have for the rest of the building, and also stepping down to three stories at Riverton. Similar at Inverness, we're stepping down to two stories, and also in plan, stepping back an additional 11 and 14 feet um, at this location. These are the building breaks at Sylvan and Springfield, again, the, the, with the pool courtyard and the surface parking. Um, we have a break from ground to sky in those areas. This is a rendering of the architectural treatment from El Camino Real. Again, this is the intention is to have um, a really engaging active street frontage for pedestrians. Uh, the building frontage steps front and back. Um, there's individual stoops as well as building lobbies that face El Camino. Uh, there's two driveway entrances for surface parking for the residents. And there's a street tree planting here that's part of the uh, Grand Boulevard initiative. Uh, so the idea would be that there's um, street trees, there's also a green buffer between the back of walk and the buildings that varies in depth. At some points, it's uh, a few feet of green planting behind the walk, and at some points, it expands to actually be what we're calling a, a small park at, pocket park, where there would actually be a bench or a, a seating area open to the public that someone could pause on their way uh, walking along El Camino Real. This is the berm on Old County Road, uh, showing some increased planning. Again, this is... Uh, similar roof forms that we have on the, the west side of the project. You can see the building hip roof stepping down uh, as well as stepping back in plan. And this is the um, step down to two stories at Inverness here. And this is the break between buildings one and two. Again, this is the retail plaza. Uh, really want to create a center for uh, the depot create a destination and not just a place to drive through and, and drop people off. It's a sea of asphalt. Um, again, engaging the pedestrian, connecting the, the east and west side. This is really going to be, I think, the civic focal point uh, for the project. Okay. Another um, topic of discussion that's come up quite a bit with the residents on the east side is the the height of the building and the relationship to the, the single family residents um, on the east side of the project. And so I've, I've taken, this is a pretty typical planning uh, code standard, not just from, this is actually from the city of San Carlos, but other cities uh, up and down the peninsula have a similar relationship of high density, uh, multifamily residential adjacent to single family. And as you can see, the height is um, directly proportional to the distance from the property line. And so if, if this were, if, if the single family homes were directly adjacent to the project, um, a project with a height of 50 feet would need to be set back 50 feet from the property line, essentially. Uh, this is another diagram from the planning code illustrating a similar point with a right of way between. Um, this is the relationship of our project uh, to the residents on the east side. So walking through the building section, this is our four-story building <coughs> with a garage that's partially above grade. This is our setback to the Caltrain tracks with a Caltrain berm in the middle. Then we have the right-of-way for Old County Road, uh, sidewalk, 
yard set back, and then the first single family house. Uh, going from north to south, this is the Riverton Drive. It's a little bit hard to read here, but basically our four story building frontage uh, to the face of building at Riverton is about 192 feet, uh, just to give perspective of uh, the height of the building at plus or minus 48 feet versus the distance of 192 feet. Similarly, uh, Inverness, a similar relationship. It's, the, the setback actually reduces slightly. I think it's like 189 feet at this location, 176 feet at Sylvan, 175 feet at Springfield. Um, so that's the basic relationship of the height of the project as it relates to the single family residences. And this leads into, um, I'd like to show just a couple of animations of the shadow studies, uh, also illustrating that point that even though we do have a four story building, the distance uh, from the adjacent neighbors, um, it just puts the shadows in perspective of what a four story building at that distance does in relation to the single family homes that are currently there. Um, we'll start with the summer solstice clip. So this is running through from morning until night, and I'll, I'll pause it and stop it at a couple points after it runs through the first time. It's basically two seconds of animation per hour um, as the shadows are going from uh, east to west here. So you can see the shadows start to get longer. They're about to touch the berm here, the Caltrain berm here. And you can see the shadows. I'm going to pause it at this point here. Uh, you can see the shadows starting to come up onto the top of the berm here. The berm itself is casting shadows. Um, but the single family homes and, and tree planting are also casting shadows too. And with the buildings being, you know, 10 or 12 feet apart, uh, the shadows of adjacent neighbors are already impacting these buildings long before uh, the four story building that's 175 plus feet away starts to impact. So this is where our project starts to touch the first house on Old County Road. But you can see how much shadow is already cast in the neighborhood at that point from the single family homes and planting in the area. So yes, our buildings do cast shadows, but everything in the neighborhood casts shadows as well. And I think ours are in proportion. And then I'll just show the equinox as well. Uh, Oops. Can I may interrupt for a quick question? Sure. sure. Go ahead. Um, what was the latest time stamp on the animation when, you end, when it ended? How late in the day did you go on the equinox? Uh, right till about 10 minutes before sunset. So it's about sunset okay. in the summer is at 8.30, 8.35. And uh, the animation runs until just after 8. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Again, I'll run this, uh, I'll pause this when the shadows start to touch the first house at Old County Road. This is the equinox rendering here. Sunset at the equinox is at 7.06. So this is 24, 25 seconds. So this is about an hour before sunset. So this is about 6 o'clock. And this is when the first shadows are starting to touch the first houses along Old County Road. Um, so that concludes my presentation. It was a quick overview. Are there any questions in the general aspects of the architecture at this point? Or I'm sure there'll be a lot more in phase two. But yeah. Questions? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for your presentation. A um, couple of questions. Part of the EIR analysis that I, I recall reading talked about how um, the Caltrain lot as it exists and as it will re-exist after it's moved is actually uh, uh, the usage rates relatively low. I mean, it is. So was consideration ever given to some kind of option which resulted in a, in a smaller parking lot and spreading the buildings out more, which therefore would mean they wouldn't have to be as high? You see what I'm getting at? In other words, if you have excess parking space, sure. why not sure. use it for something else? Sure. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of aspects to that. One is, um, I, th I think, for the future growth and the future options uh, for the operation of the train. Um, Long-term, Samtrans was interested in preserving the current number of parking spaces that they have. 
one thing that's going to happen at, at some point down the road, and I, I should let um, Sam Trans probably speak to this, is that the current platform location is going to shift further south. And I don't know what the timeline for that is, but I think the idea is to leave that southern portion of the site open for options that they have uh, as part of their management plan down the road. I, I'm not surprised to, to hear that. I guess I'll just mention in passing that I will have a question later on about whether or not that indicates a higher level of use of the rail corridor than perhaps was contemplated in the EIR. In other words, if, if one is anticipating needing more parking spaces, that's because one is expecting to have bigger or more frequent trains. Um, the other question I had uh, related to that is, was a possibility of, well, let me describe it this way, uh, starting the project as far south as you could, basically inverting it and, and building towards the north and putting things like the parking lot on the north end, okay? Because uh, the further south you go along El Camino and San Carlos, across the berm, it's increasingly industrial and commercial and not impacting residences as much. That's true. Um, I'm just going to pull up the overall site plan so we can kind of point here. Um, the other aspect of the site, it does get more commercial as you go further south, but the other thing that happens is the site gets more and more narrow as you go further south. You can see that the, the width of the site at, at the southernmost end is, is quite different than at the northernmost end. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I yeah. do realize that, but I guess what I was getting at, particularly in combination of the idea of possibly shrinking the parking lot, is the trade-off oh. such that, that um, uh, and it obviously would affect the economics. I'm just wondering if that was ever considered. You know, I know it's wider towards the north, but which makes it easier to develop, but that's not necessarily means it's infeasible to develop it the other way. Right. Um, from the residential aspect, uh, no, that wasn't that was not studied as part of our. We we okay. Essentially, started at the north end. Um, architecturally, and, and for the residents, it's it's the more appealing uh, part of the site because of the depth of the site. Right. Um, having these sheltered courtyards, I think, is a big plus for the residents. Um, having um, interfacing courtyards because. Um, it's not just the train, it's also El Camino. There's, there's two fairly intense uses on both mm -hmm. sides of the site. And so the more depth that we can have mm -hmm. to work within, it's just it's more appealing for a residential project. So that's where we focused our efforts. I understand. Yeah. It's all a matter of trade-offs, though. So Sure. Thank you. I just one quick question. Uh, the trees, all the trees that were shown on the, on the different drawings? Yes. What's the time, uh, an estimate of how long it'll take for them to grow to that size? Um, I think the... I'm not a landscape architect, but I believe the direction that they were given was uh, 10 years. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just have one question. When you were doing the, the, no, the shadowing um, model, um, does that assume that the that the buildings, that the most of the height of the buildings has been pushed toward El Camino, or does that just assume a uniform height? Um, the buildings are actually modeled as they are in the plan. So the majority of the project is four stories. Um, the, the areas where it steps down are uh, three stories at this notch in line with Riverton and two stories at the notch aligned um, with Inverness. And, um, but the majority of the project is four stories. And so the buildings that you saw in that model were actually these buildings modeled at, at the heights that they're shown. So if, so if it's four stories at El Camino, it's four stories 40 feet back? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Karen? Do you have any questions for her? I don't have any questions right now. Okay. I, I have a few. So if you uh, hold up there. Um, the pedestrian crossing Holly going towards the depot from the primary four buildings of residential, uh, where does that happen? Do they Are they expected to somehow cross over Old County and then go down Old County and come back? Or is the idea that they'll go down El Camino and somehow cross Holly Street at El Camino? Uh, what's, for the, uh, what's the plan? For the new residents? Yeah, you've got, I don't know, uh, you've got, you said 280 residential units for those. They would be crossing Holly at El Camino here. So they would be, um, the, the building entrances are all at El Camino. So they would okay. walk along El Camino, cross Holly at El Camino, and then on to um, onto the depot. And so um, it, now if they're doing that, is there any, you, there's anticipation for some kind of change or improvement to that intersection to allow that to happen? Yes, yes, there is. Um, and I don't Can you have, show us that? Let me see. I don't know that I have that slide. I don't think I have the civil drawings. Um, let me see. 
I have a printed version of the civil drawings. I don't have it. I don't have it on my slide. I'm sorry, but I can, I can get that to you. Okay. Um, <coughs> and I guess you've already said so. The parking location versus the train platform. You're not sure about that because that's somebody else. That that's that's a separate. Fans. That's a separate project. Separate but it would project. be shifting further south. My understanding is at some point in the future, the platform would be shifting further south. And I, I don't have more details than that. I don't know if Brian. I wonder if that's um, contingent on high-speed rail and what what they're doing or what. I guess to the mayor's question, I believe yeah. that that is indeed the case. That if uh, if there's a need for passing tracks, you would need to shift the platform south. But if, on the other hand, there are no passing tracks, high-speed rail doesn't come, or the passing tracks are somewhere else, not in San Carlos, then there'd be no need to move the platform. Is, uh, your mic on? is your mic on? I don't think it's on. Light, the light was on. Light is on, but on. You want to try that again? <laughs> is it on now? Now it's yeah. on. Oh, now it's Beautiful. On. Okay, to the, to the mayor's question, uh, essentially moving the platform towards Arroyo is required if pl passing tracks go through San Carlos. Uh, on the other hand, if high-speed rail and passing tracks never come, in other words, the status quo continues, or if the passing tracks land somewhere else other than San Carlos, there's no need to move the platform. So that's the determination. There is no need to move the platform, even though the distance from the parking as it currently exists to the platform is going to be increased by moving the parking south. Correct. I'm just curious about all these distances from uh, two locations. One, the distance that folks who are living in the um, uh, out of 280 residential units, how many are in the north, north of Holly? Um, close to 200. So, okay, a good percentage. Uh, uh, that's what two thirds of it. Um, those, those folks, if they if the idea, as Mr. Simon was talking about, the idea is to create customers for Samtrans. 200 of them, 200 of those households at least are going to be north of Holly Street, and they're going to be expected to uh, walk that distance down El Camino, cross over Holly, and continue walking until they get to the rail platform. Correct. Correct? And be curious what that distance is and, and how much uh, how much how much studies how much studies been done about people's willingness to go that far. Conversely if we move the parking to the south, how far is it, uh, f say, from even 50% of the parking off of that distance? We do distance. have some data on that as part of the EIR. I'm okay. It's probably not really a question for, for you as the architect, but... Yeah. but Actually, does yeah. Brian Fitzpatrick from, from Sam Trans sure. can yeah. probably Go ahead. address these questions. Okay. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Brian Fitzpatrick, manager of real estate and property development for Caltrain and, and uh, Samtrans. It, we've hit on a couple things, and so I thought maybe I could wrap some of this up for you in terms of your questions. Um, first of all, um, when you look at the area that is to the south where the parking will be moved, before we started this project, we looked at the project and we, there was no such thing as high-speed rail. But we looked at the project from Caltrain's perspective, and we said we would be foolish if we developed a transit village and we didn't account for the ability for this railroad to, to expand. Even though we're not planning on doing it, we got to make sure we do that. So we set forth an area that was reserved for a four-track scenario. That area that was needed for four tracks never made it into the RFP. In other words, the developers were told, you can't touch this area. So what that means is the southern area where the parking lot currently is located it's only about 50 feet wide as you go out there now. By the time you remove what we needed for four tracks, you can't develop out there. So you can't shift because you can't, there's just not enough area to really developing any, anything of meaning at this. That's question one. Uh, question two to, to the mayor's points about walking distance. One of the things that we did uh, as a study for this project is we looked at how we would attract ridership by bringing 281 units and somewhat, you know, around, let's say, 600 people to the proximity of the station living there. How many people would we would generate from that? 
And we compared that to what loss we might experience by moving these parking spots somewhat further away from the development. And uh, the, the work that was done by, by Mr. Uh, Canepa, who's back here, basically told us we won't lose anybody who currently parks in the station because they have to ride farther. We're, we're within normal bounds and normal um, walking distances as defined by a lot of studies. We don't anticipate losing anybody. We anticipate gaining a ton of riders from the people who will live right there and will walk to the station. Um, and then the last question I think that you had was right now we park on an average per month daily parkers per our 2012 count 67 a day. But there's sort of a wide variance because what I did is I looked back at the 2012 numbers and I said, well, let's look per month to see what kind of variance we get. And it's between about 59 and 91 per month. That's kind of the variance you get. So the parking lot's about half full. We also were concerned about reducing the amount of parking because we don't want to build for today. We want to build for the future. So we want to make sure that we're accommodating for everything as best we can. So I think that's kind of wrapped up some of your questions, but I'll be glad to answer anything else you might have. The, 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 the last statistic you gave, 59 to 91 parking per day? Correct. Uh, on a monthly in and out basis? Yeah, so what we do is we count um, once a month and um, then that average on that once a month count through the fiscal year 2012 was 67. Okay. And then the variance, May through September, which is just a little bit more current. I look back at those last few months just to get an idea of the variance. And in those six months, the low was 59, the high was 91. So it gives you kind of an idea of the average, and it gives you kind of an idea that there is a little bit of a, of a you know, up and down pattern to that. And, and what is the distance then in either extreme of the project that people are being asked to walk if they're going to walk from, say, their home on the north side or from their uh, parking space on the south side. Right. And, the and extreme I, distance. Yeah, I, I, I don't at. know those numbers. We have the numbers. Exactly off the top of my head. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's let that sit out there. And we'll let that sit out there. I'll let technical that, experts so. get back to you on that. But I thought that would help you uh, look at the context and see how we did what we did. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah, we, we have a good deal of research with regard to walking distance and acceptability mm -hmm. of walking distance and what's, uh, we, it's actually measured in level of service and what's an acceptable, very much like traffic is. Um, it's, you know, you have a good level of service, level of service A or or, or worse, and so we've done a good deal of analysis, and we do have all the distances um, with regard to the parking areas um, that we can share with the city council, if you'd like us to do that now. Um, also, as part of the presentation, we have uh, the parking consultant that will be giving a presentation, and he can okay. talk about the distances okay. as well. Let's do that then, then. that's good. Um, And I think some, this other question I have will probably come up later too with traffic and circulation, but I, from the architect's presentation, it just made me jot down a question here about the impact of uh, the southern transfer of the SamTrans parking uh, to El Camino intersections at Cherry, and I'm trying to think what the other one is. What's the intersection just further, the next block down from Cherry is? Arroyo. Arroyo. Or that's Olive. Olive. Olive and then Arroyo. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay. So I guess those will come up later. Let me just check my notes, see what else I have here. Um, oh, regarding the landscaping, uh, the vice mayor was asking about the maturity of the trees as depicted, but I was, uh, which I thought was a good question. And my question was um, regarding those trees and the landscaping show on the berm, is, is that going to be owned by the project or will it be owned by whom and who will be in charge of maintaining it and so forth? Well, we can talk about the current ownership. Um, currently, the trees on the berm mm -hmm. and the landscaping on, on the berm is uh, maintained by SamTrans, and the flat areas are maintained by the city of San Carlos. The flat areas? So they would, the, yeah, anything below the foot of the berm out toward El Camino Real. Okay, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Save, I'm talking about, um, I wasn't clear. Uh, on the old county side, because uh, a lot of the depictions that the architect showed was of this improved landscaping 
and so the question came to my mind if if the improved landscaping is put in um, it's great that it's there who's going to maintain it and take care of it and be responsible for it and the expectation that staff has had uh, through the process is that it would continue to be maintained by Sam trans okay all right thanks those are my questions next presenter oh uh, we have one more question here. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up something about parking um, according to the attachment three it says uh, and I just want to clarify this because it's it's part of what it does say in and some of it's what it doesn't say. It says the distance from the furthest parking space of the Caltrain Southern Stairs, uh, and this is assuming you are at El Camino and Olive, is approximately 1,170 feet, which I calculate to be about a fifth of a, of a mile. And, but then further in the next paragraph, it says um, uh, the distance from, I assume this is a Royal Pedestrian Undercrossing, is 1,260 feet to the southern stairs so that's a quarter of a mile what I what I don't see in here maybe I maybe I missed it is uh, the distance from the f northernmost building which is would be at what Oak Street there to the probably the northern stairs I assume is that is that in here that I just missed <clears throat> no, I don't believe it is however I think we could get that information for you in just a few minutes we could have some measurements done and we can provide that to you later in the meeting Okay, thank All you. Right. Very good. Okay, who's up next? <clears throat> I'm going to guess that I'm next since no one else is coming up. I didn't print out the agenda before I came in the room tonight. Um, my name is Michael Kay. I am a project manager for Atkins. <coughs> we were hired by the city to provide the uh, secret documentation for the proposed project. And I am going to do my best to get started with this presentation. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Mayor, members of the council, as I said, my name is Michael Kay. Um, what I want to do is just give a real brief overview of the CEQA process and then give a brief um, overview of some of the impacts that uh, we determined at, through the CEQA process might uh, result from the post project and try to uh, emphasize the issues that are of most concern to the community. Um, I also have Chris Shields here. He's going to give a separate presentation on the noise analysis and uh, Gary Black from Hexagon Transportation uh, is going to give a presentation on the transportation impacts of the project. So, mm -hmm. let's see. So what are the purposes of CEQA? Um, basically, and it was discussed a little earlier when the meeting started, CEQA is a tool to provide decision makers and the public with a document that looks at the uh, potential physical impacts of a proposed project. Um, it identifies way environmental damages can be avoided or reduced through uh, changes in the project description or mitigation measures. And it also discloses the reasons why a project might be approved and regardless of whether or not significant environmental impacts would result from the project. This comes after the sequel process, after the uh, final environmental document is adopted. Um, the uh, uh, approving agency would have to adopt what's called a statement of overriding considerations. So what constitutes significance? Again, the thing that um, really is important with CEQA, that the impacts are based on changes to the physical con conditions of the project area or the area immediately surrounding the project. Uh, significance is based on, to the extent as possible, on scientific and factual data. And the lead agency must consider direct physical changes to the environment um, and reasonably foreseeable indirect physical changes to the environment. We also look at um, not only the effects of the proposed project, but um, the potential effects of the project in um, association with uh, planned and future projects under what's called a cumulative analysis. So how is significance determined? Um, <coughs> the main thresholds that we use when determining the significance of a project are in the CEQA guidelines, Appendix G of the state CEQA guidelines, which were adopted by the state of California back when um, the CEQA regulations were first passed. Um, we also look at agency regulatory 
third standards, such as the standards that um, Caltrans might have for changes in level of service of Caltrans facilities, or um, thresholds that the Bay Area Air Quality Management District may have when looking at impacts to air quality associated with the project, both the operationally or with construction impacts. And uh, we also consider either any CEQA standards that have been adopted by the City of San Carlos in our analysis. Okay, what is a significant impact? Um, what CEQA wants to, uh, attempts to do is rely on independent judgment to decide whether a project may have the potential to carp, cause substantial environmental harm to the physical environment. Um, Many times there will be disagreement among experts. Um, we have a number of the technical support to uh, the conclusions in the environmental document. Um, other uh, technicians or experts may come to a different conclusion uh, on their studies. Um, in that case, it really doesn't mean that the, the, there should be a determination that the impact is significant. Uh, the lead agency is then tasked with making a determination on which of the studies they are going to support, and as long as they document that decision, they've complied with CEQA. Uh, factors not relative to CEQA um, have to do with things like public controversy and potential effects on economic and social or property values. These are not um, determined to be changes to the, the physical environment. So those are not considered significant effects under CEQA. And public opinion is not considered a significant effect under CEQA. As was mentioned earlier, um, the uh, environment, the, the, this is really separate from the proposed project, the environmental document. Um, the, the environmental document can be approved without approving the proposed project. Just because the environmental document is approved by the lead agency does not mean that the lead agency is in effect approving the project. Those are really two separate approvals that need to take place. So again, economic issues are not discussed in CEQA. Uh, it's, they typically do not lead to a physical change in the environment. If a connection could be made to a potential economic loss that then led to physical changes in the environment, that would be considered under CEQA. Um, public costs or revenue associated with the project are not considered, but many times that information is disclosed in the CEQA document for informational purposes only. Can, uh, may I interrupt you? Sure. Because you're, you're going through a lot of stuff there. If you back up once. One slide? Uh, yeah. So, so can you give an example of social and economic issues that could cause physical damage? Um, have you seen that before in your work? I, I have not seen it. I haven't worked on a project, but the, the classic case or the classic example in that project had to do with the proposed Walmart. And I believe it was in a city in the Central Valley. And um, the opponents could demonstrate that the Walmart would cause um, uh, the local downtown to become economically unviable. Therefore, many of the stores would close down. The stores would then go uh, become deteriorated. And they, that could lead to secondary adverse effects in the physical environment, because you would cre be creating unsafe conditions in the downtown associated with um, abandonment of the buildings due to their economic they were no longer economically viable to, due to the fact that Walmart would siphon too much of the uh, businesses away from those, those businesses. So if you carry that out, somebody made that case mm -hmm. and they somehow documented it or uh, they can't prove the theory, but they can certainly substantiate it perhaps somehow. Mm -hmm. Is that what was done? Yes. Well, well, it was determined that they wouldn't have to d make a determination on whether or not that was a possible effect of the project. I don't know what the other eventual outcome was. If they, there was enough information in the record that they could make an argument that that was a potential outcome and so mitigation measures would have to be provided to avoid that outcome. I just know that they were successful in challenging the um, environmental document on that basis. So they didn't necessarily stop the project or anything like that. They just again, I don't yeah, know if, you if don't know. that did stop the project or not. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the finally, I, I, the, the project has um, we've been doing the environmental documentation for a number of years now. We had a notice of we had a scoping meeting when a notice of preparation was circulated prior to the start of the environmental process. A draft document was circulated to the public, and the project was put on hold for um, some time because there was a question on uh, what was going to happen with the California High Speed Rail Authority in the corridor. 
Um, it thought, we thought that uh, in consultation with city staff, we were going to um, slow down on the environmental documentation, <coughs> hoping that there would be more information pertinent to the project coming from the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, when the planning on the, the peninsula for the high speed rail looked like it was also going to slow down, we made a determination to go ahead with the uh, environmental documentation for this project. So uh, we circulated the uh, draft document in, uh, this past summer. Um, we, um, the, the draft env environmental document includes um, all the comments that we received during, I'm sorry, the final environmental document includes all the comments that were received during the circulation of the draft document. We delineated all those comments. Um, when the comments spoke directly to the environmental document, we've uh, come up with a specific response to that comment. Um, there were quite a few comments on transportation, visual noise, the alternatives analysis, and uh, potential <coughs> effects of the high-speed rail project. So the final document, as you've probably seen, also includes what we call master responses. Rather than to respond to each of those comments individually, we created a, a master response that, that, that hits all the points raised within those topics by, by the public and the agencies uh, when they commented on the draft document. Um, in addition, we fully revised the visual, uh, visual quality and section of the draft EIR, and that's included uh, in the final EIR. Um, and again, as I said, the uh, draft or the final EIR went out for public review in July of this year. And as you know, we've had a number of uh, public hearings before the Planning Commission on the document that is continuing tonight. Um, and again, I just want to give a brief overview of some of the topics, some of the topics that were of major concern um, to the public and the community. Um, the visual quality master response uh, included more information regarding the height, mass, uh, visual character, shadows, and views of the PROS project. We had um, more detailed uh, project consistency with applicable regulations from the City of San Carlos. We also included some additional visual and shadow simulations, but um, with that information, we did not have a change in the conclusion of the draft ER. The, um, the, the final environmental document and the draft EIR determined that uh, visual impacts, while there may be some visual impacts associated with the project, none of those rose to a level of significance that would then require mitigation measures. And I, I should step back, and when we did do a, an additional visual and shadow simulations, however, um, Shadow impacts are not uh, deemed a physical change in the environment under CEQA. So that was information included in the environmental document for um, informational purposes only. Um, we did include some figures, and I've got the figures in my uh, presentation here, but the figures are, are not as um, well prepared as the ones you saw previously from the architect. So I am going to include those in this presentation, but um, as when we get to those, I'll explain the differences between our figures and the ones presented by the architect. Um, before I leave this slide, the, like I said, the um, uh, shadow, increase in shadow is not um, considered a significant under, impact under CEQA. However, there have been some jurisdictions in California, such as San Francisco, that has determined that they, they want to consider um, the in potential impacts of shadow. But in San Francisco, I believe that that mainly has to do with whether um, shadow is going to be cast on um, public parklands with the proposed project. And um, they have regulations regarding a, a, um, a, the percent shadow that could fall on a, a public resource such as a park. Um, these are also from the uh, draft document and the uh, final EIR. It's just a couple of visual simulations from the, for the proposed project. Um, in each of these uh, subsequent slides, the top is the existing condition and the lower uh, um, photograph or simulation is, is with the proposed project. Um, under the CEQA standards, uh, what is considered impacts under the visual uh, effects really have to do with the massing and height of a proposed project. Um, many times we uh, will create simulations that do not in include any of the articulation on the building, such as windows or um, colors or uh, trellises, etc. Because um, as the process goes through the um, planning and approval process of the project, many times those types of things can change over time. So really what we're looking at is um, the, the height of the building is consistent 
with what's being proposed and the massing of the building is consistent with what we propose. So this creates an outside envelope against which we can uh, examine the visual impacts of the proposed project. Again, this is um, looking from um, Old County Road facing west at approximately Sylvan Road. The top is the existing condition and the bottom is with the proposed project. Another shot looking at Old County Road from Riverton Road. And again, if I'm going through too, uh, too quickly through these, uh, please let me know and I can slow down. Um, this is a simulation looking from L'Oreola Park facing west. Um, you can see the proposed project in, in this area. This is another simulation from the park. This is just um, uh, farther into the park itself. You can see where the, the, um, the post project becomes visible just above the treetops and the rooftops. This is closer to the middle of the park, whereas the um, previous simulation was taken from further back away from the project. And this is Old Camino Real, or El Camino Real looking south from Oak Street. And at Holly Street, looking northwest. Okay, El Camino from Bush, looking south. And these are the SATA simulations that I mentioned earlier that we included in the EIR. Now, the, the limitation with, with these figures is it only sh shows the shadows that are being cast by the proposed project. It doesn't include any of the intervening existing shadows from things like the berm or existing trees or the existing structures that um, are in the uh, surrounding the project area. Um, we looked at a number of different hours um, starting from uh, 10 a.m. through noon and then down to 5 p.m. Um, these are the, the shadows that would be cast by the project at the winter solstice. You can see from um, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. that there are no shadows because at, at the winter solstice, the, the, the sun sets um, at probably around 4.30. Um, at the equinox, you can see that um, the, the shadows don't quite reach across the street by 5 p.m. Um, obviously, in the summertime or in the uh, morning, the sun is on the other side of the, the proposed project, so there wouldn't be any shadows cast on the residential neighborhood. At the summer solstice, the um, sun is much higher in the sky, so the shadows that are cast at 5 p.m. Are, are shorter than they would have been at the spring um, equinox. And then we're back at the autumn ex equinox. So this is very similar to what would occur at the spring equinox. We were also asked to provide additional information for the shadows that would be cast at the summer solstice. So this is what um, was in the previous slide. Um, by 7 p.m., the shadows are starting to cross the street, and then by 7.20 p.m., before the sun sets, the shadows actually would go extensively into the neighborhood. Um, but as I said earlier, this is very limited because we don't have any elevations for the area outside the proposed project. So this assumes that um, if everything around the proposed project is flat. There are no trees, there are no buildings. So there, there are, there are no, um, this assumes that there are no structures between the, the edges of the shadow and the proposed project. So you know, in reality, they wouldn't extend this far because of all the intervening uh, structures and trees. So the high-speed train cube analysis, um, as I mentioned earlier, we put the project on hold because we were hoping we'd have more information about the high-speed train project against which we could evaluate our cumulative condition. Um, when that wasn't forthcoming, what we did was um, the, the, um, the high-speed train looked at a number of different alternatives on the peninsula. Um, one of those alternatives included a four-track aerial viaduct through San Carlos. Uh, we decided that that would represent the worst case scenario, so that was the alternative that we chose to look at in our cumulative analysis. Um, and again, this was done as part of the um, master response to the comments received on the draft. And it, when we looked at the worst case scenario, it did not result in any changes in the conclusions in the draft document as far as the cumulative analysis. Um, what the cumulative analysis really looks at is um, would your proposed project um, 
in, uh, the effects of the proposed project in relation to and in addition to the effects of cumulative projects, would those have what's called a cumulative adverse effect on the environment? And if so, would the proposed project be cumulatively considerable? That is, is the contribution from the project enough, the, the contribution from the proposed project to the cumulative impact, would that be enough such that the proposed project itself would be required to provide mitigation? In the case with the high-speed rail project, um, the major adverse effects of a high-speed train looking at the worst-case scenario with a four-track aerial viaduct um, those impacts would far outweigh the impacts associated with the proposed project. Therefore, while there were some aspects where the project would contribute to the cumulative impact, it was never deemed to be cons cumulatively considerable. So, in a sense, what we're saying is that the adverse effects of the high-speed rail project will be evaluated uh, in the environmental document for the high-speed rail project because uh, our contribution to the cumulative impacts is not severe enough that we have to develop mitigation measures for our project alone. All the, all the impacts of the high-speed rail project will be, and, and mitigation measures will be bore by the high-speed rail project, not our project. We also looked at another um, alternative in the final document. There was some, the, the original um, draft document had alternatives, including a no-build no build alternative as well as a, um, a reduced size alternative. Um, there was some uh, thought that maybe we could look at what we, uh, a, a change in the mass and size of the buildings as, as part of the, the proposed project. Um, in consultations with the architect, it was determined that those really wouldn't work economically. So, but, but there was a lot of value in the um, alternative that was proposed. So we were able to um, develop what we call the revised massing alternative. Um, they would look at a variation in uh, height and bulk of the buildings. Um, the increase, it would increase the height of the buildings at the Holly Street corridor, uh, increase separation between the buildings to reinforce the view corridors, and a reduction in the number of, of the uh, proposed units. And the result of the analysis, which is detailed in the final EIR, is that the revised massing alternative would result in impacts similar to the proposed project. However, they would lessen those impacts to a slight degree. Um, the, the purpose of the alternatives analysis in CEQA is to look at alternatives to the project that might uh, reduce the, the significant effects of the proposed project. Um, we don't have to give an exhaustive um, uh, potential range of proposed projects. And uh, we're tasked with making sure that any of the alternatives meet the majority of the goals of the, the project itself. For example, if the goals of the project include we want to have a um, transit oriented development at the Caltrain site, an alternative to the project is, is not to build single family homes some distance from the proposed project because that wouldn't meet the objectives or the goals of the proposed project. So in, in the case of this project, um, we were really were limited to the, um, the location of, of the proposed project when we looked at alternatives because otherwise we couldn't meet that goal that this is going to be transit oriented development. Um, we did do some uh, visual simulations of the, the alternatives, and again, this is the existing condition, and um, this is the proposed project. Uh, I put this here to, um, so that we have a better sense of what the alternatives would look like. So this is the reduced intensity alternative. This one is the revised massing alternative. Now, as I said earlier, uh, typically, um, visual simulations just look at height and bulk. Um, in the case of the previous slide, this is the proposed project. We had enough information about the design. The design had gone far enough that we were able to um, put the, um, the articulation and the windows on the project. But because it's an al the alternative is an alternative to the project, it, it doesn't make sense to, to start looking at um, articulation or fenestration on the project. So at the top here, this is the reduced intensity alternative. This is the outside envelope that would result from that project, um, that alternative. And the bottom is the revised massing alternative. So you can see there's a the slight variation in the height in some locations as with the reduced intensity alternative. 
But you said that the reduced intensity alter alternative was not economically viable. Is that right? Well, not that it wasn't economically viable. The um, that that's not a decision for the environmental document to make. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 really up to to the city and the applicant. Um, what the alternative, the role of the alternatives, is to pre present options in the environmental document that could lessen the severity of any adverse impacts associated with the pro project. Okay, but you said one of those was less viable than. Oh, I'm other. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the. Alternative that was proposed by a member of the community mm -hmm. after the, the review of the draft document, um, the architect determined couldn't work for them um, at the level. He, that that, that um, alternative did include quite a bit of plans. I think it also included floor plans. Um, the architect determined that that wouldn't work for them, but they were able to take some of the, the features of that alternative in development of the, the revised massing alternative. Mr. Mayor, may I tag along on that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the questions I had actually is the staff summary of the revised massing alternative. The very last sentence of it says, for these reasons, the FEIR concludes that the revised massing alternative is infeasible. Mm -hmm. And I'm frankly yet to hear anything in what you said that I would map as infeasible. Less attractive, yes. Less other things, yes. But I'm not. I'm not sure, and I know you didn't write the staff report, but I yeah, I, I, I unfortunately don't have that information in front of me, so I can't speak to that. The, um, the city staff yeah. may be better to sure. From a staff perspective, I don't think that's correct. Um, you know, in terms of the EIR, it's it's not correct. What we've heard from the project applicant is that um, the alternative where you push the uh, height and density down toward uh, Holly Street is infeasible for a number of different reasons. One is that it changes the construction type, and two, if you add units on either side of Holly Street, you can't provide the parking underneath those units because you have a water table uh, and you'd need to go deeper with the parking structure. So we heard from the from the developer that 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 alternative was economically infeasible. So that I think perhaps got lost in translation from the EIR to the staff report. And we can always okay. clarify with the developer on that as well. Process question mm -hmm. related to this. How does a body like this, if it so desires, push towards an alternative other than the proposed project? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Through the environmental process or after the yes. environmental process is concluded? Th um, through the environmental process. Again, I think the that's lesson, a, Excuse me. To, to, you know, in your field of work then, if we thought, well, we want to, we, we don't want to do a no-build project. That, like you said, it doesn't meet the mm -hmm. goals. But to meet the goals, but to lessen the impact environmentally, choosing some alternative other than what's being proposed. How do you drive towards that? Well, the, um, maybe if I answer it this way, it'll help. Um, the alternatives, as I said earlier, look at a, a reduced size of the proposed project. So in a sense, the, the, um, the proposed project itself is the outside envelope um, that could um, that the city could approve for construction at the site without having to reopen the environmental document because all of our potential impacts are based on the largest proposed project. <coughs> so subsequent to the environmental review process and adoption of the EIR and statements of order providing considerations if necessary, the council can work with city staff and the applicant on revising the proposed project to come up with something that might be more um, acceptable to the city. As long as that project is within the larger envelope that was um, evaluated in the environmental document, the CEQA process doesn't have to be reopened in terms of an addendum to the CEQA document or a reevaluation of the proposed project in a subsequent CEQA document. But is it unreasonable to push the backstop closer to you see what I'm saying? You know, at this point in the process, to to move the backstop or the goal line or whatever analogy you want to make, 
so that you set it right there and you know you're not going to get a project that has any greater impact than X? Well, that's a separate process. You're talking about approving the project. Okay. We've evaluated the proposed project. Um, if you're looking at a smaller project, that fits within the evaluation envelope for the existing environmental document. Okay, gotcha. Because you're not going to approve a project that has an increase in impacts. So that that's a project approval, not environmental documentation. Okay, understood. Okay. I think there are a few more simulations. Okay, this is from Old County Road facing west. Again, this is the existing condition. This is the proposed project. And this is the reduced intensity alternative, the revised massing alternative. So you can see here where you know this has been set back. It's 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 shorter than than the proposed project. Um, these next few slides are can be difficult to see from where you are. These are also in the final environmental document. But um, this is a profile of the three alternatives that were evaluated in the environmental document. The top, uh, this is facing west. Holly Street is to the left. This is the proposed project. We have Springfield Drive, Sylvan Drive, Inverness, and Riverton. This is a profile of reduced intensity alternative. This is a profile of the revised massing. Now, scale is similar on all these projects, so you can make a comparison on what was proposed with the three alternatives. The next slide is a similar. It just shows the various heights of the, the um, different alternatives. And then what we've done with this slide is to um, try to provide a, a better idea of what the differences are among the alternatives. Um, in the top profile, what's in yellow is the revised massing alternative. What's in red is the reduced intensity alternative. So you can see how the um, revised massing has a, a, a smaller building at this location. With the reduced intensity alternative, you know, you're, you're getting closer to, um, you have a, a reduced separation between the buildings. This middle figure shows the revised massing alternative again in yellow with the proposed project. The proposed project here is, is shown uh, in transparency. So you can see that the proposed project is much higher at locations. Um, the buildings number two and building number three are larger. And um, building number one is much higher under the proposed project. This last figure does the same thing, the comparison between the proposed project and the reduced intensity alternative. Um, as you can see, there is not as much difference between those two projects as there are between the revised massing and the proposed project. And again, these figures are in the environmental document. Um, they're probably clearer if you can and see them in front of you rather than uh, that distance from, from the projector. They're actually pretty good from up here. Okay, good. <laughs> um, as I said earlier, uh, we've got uh, folks here to talk about some of the other impacts associated with the project. I just want to make a conclusion that um, the, the environmental document determined that there would be no impact. The, the, there, there's three alternatives we can come up with with our, um, our thresholds. No impact, less than significant, uh, significant. If we determine that the impact would be significant, SECRA requires us to propose mitigation measures. If we can demonstrate the mitigation measure would reduce that level of impact to less than significant with adoption of mitigation measures, that's designated in the environmental document. If we... Um, if implementation of the mitigation measure would not reduce the impact to less than significant, then it's deemed significant unavoidable. For the purposes of this analysis, we looked at there would be potentially significant and significant impacts to the following items on the list there. However, in all cases, we found that there was feasible mitigation measures to reduce those impacts to a level of less than significant. So approval and construction of the project would not lead to any significant unavoidable impacts per the thresholds and the um, levels or the um, thresholds of significance that were used in the environmental document. Okay. Questions? 
Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, let me start with one right off your, your last slide there. Can you remind me what was the visual quality significant or potentially significant impact that you identified that could be mitigated? We actually did not designate any significant impacts with visual quality. All of them were deemed to be less than significant, so there are no mitigation measures associated with the project uh, regarding visual impacts. Uh, okay, wait a minute. I'm confused. Then why is visual quality listed up there? Um, perhaps that's a list. I mean, that almost looks like a list of all the things that you studied. Which isn't necessarily, of course, the same list. Yeah, those are not all the topics that we studied, and perhaps I misspoke. I don't know if we included, um, perhaps there was a potential impact and we included landscape, but um, if, if I misspoke, I'm, I can uh, Okay. I mean, the, the record is whatever the, the record is. The information is in the environmental document. Right. And um, you're right, that slide shows where there would be potentially significant and significant impacts. Um, I see Deborah looking through her notes, so she may have an answer for us soon. Okay. Well, while she is looking, um, oh, okay. There were um, visual impacts relative to light and glare. Thank you. For the preparation of a, a lighting plan and um, pr design prevention and control devices for exterior lighting. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's tied to a specific significance threshold. And this is a, a typical impact associated with the project, and the mitigation measure that Deborah read is a, a standard mitigation measure. Okay. Um, my, my more substantive question, which um, I, I want to make sure I understand what my role is up here when we ultimately get to the point of casting a vote, mm -hmm. uh, assuming we come to that on this document. Um, my understanding is that essentially when a council member were, casts a vote saying, yes, I ratify or approve this EIR, that effectively what I'm doing is I'm saying to a sufficient degree that meets whatever criteria I think is appropriate, I am concurring with the conclusions and the methodology and the approaches that uh, uh, Atkins used in preparing the study, correct? That's correct. Um, and and be before you continue, and, and I, I these could be legal questions, and um, I'm not a secret attorney, so if I misspeak, I hope I will be corrected. Oh, no, I'm sure somebody will leap into that. <laughs> so, and, and, and if Thank they you. don't, we'll pause and, and allow them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, however, the other thing that is, as I understand that is important, is um, in making that uh, personal assessment, I can effectively and I cannot be arbitrary and capricious about it, but I can basically come to the conclusion, hmm, I don't agree with Atkins' judgment in this issue. I don't agree with how they assessed something. Uh, I perhaps think a different standard should have been used for determining whether some threshold was crossed. Um, uh, and you know, if enough of those were to exist in my mind, that would drive me to saying, well, gee, I'm not comfortable ratifying the document because I don't agree with you know, a sufficient number of elements in it. So in a sense, well, we have hired uh, an expert to prepare this document. At the end of the day, when we cast the vote, the council is ratifying, assuming it's a favorable vote, the council is ratifying that, saying we accept what's in there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, again, as I said earlier, and it's been said earlier in the meeting tonight, this is an informational document in order to um, give you the tools that you need to make a decision on whether or not the potential effects of the proposed project to changes on the physical environment were adequately um, determined, addressed, and if, if, if necessary, adequate mitigation measures were proposed. And, and, and just so you understand, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to lead up to some mysterious thing or not. It's just that um, inherent in the nature of this kind of process is there always are, uh, let's put it this way, reasonable people can disagree Correct. about all sorts of things that are in here. Um, and the point I was simply making, and not in a uh, domineering kind of way, but at the end of the day, when we vote, we have to look to our judgment, informed by your judgment. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but this is your document. document. Right. We, we don't just say, oh, well, somebody who knows a lot more about this than I do says X, therefore we have to do X. We have to agree that X makes sense to us. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? So I, I just had a few. Um, 
the historical site mm -hmm. that's looked at by CEQA or that's yes it is it the, is the, the train at. station right, right. yes yeah. that was evaluated and the um, I'm sorry go ahead with your question no no you yeah that that is a topic to be evaluated under CEQA cultural resources that mm -hmm. includes both the built environment and um, archaeological impacts um, we did a, a record search with Sonoma State to, to determine whether or not there were um, archaeological sites on the property or in close enough vicinity to the pro property that there was the potential to disturb archaeological resources during construction. Um, we decided that this was not the case. However, there are mitigation measures that are fairly standard if during the construction of the project and excavation um, the, the construction workers find anything. They, they, they know what to do in terms of halting work and contacting direct people. Um, the other aspect for cultural resources is the built environment. Um, obviously, the, um, the train station is on um, the, the state register, the national register, and is a historic resources as recognized by the city of San Carlos. So we did include an evaluation of whether or not the proposed project would have an adverse effect on that historic resource. Um, typically, this is based on um, many factors such as physical changes to the resource, um, proximity impacts, or um, changes in the setting so, such that it, it's no longer deemed eligible. Um, the goal under CEQA and when it's determined to be a significant impact is if the, the effects of the project are so severe that the resource is deemed that it's no longer eligible for any of the historic lists that it's on. Um, we aren't going to be making any physical changes to the project. Um, the uh, setting of the train station itself is not one of the um, recognized features that made it eligible for the list. I, I believe the features um, included in the eligibility rating have to do with um, the design of the project, or um, sorry, the train station, and as well as the role the train station had in the development of San Carlos through time. So those two features will not be changed by the proposed project. Therefore, the determination was made that the this proposed project would not have an impact on the train station from an historic resource nature. Um, the train station is an old building. Uh, there is the potential that during construction there could be um, vibration effects to the building that could cause uh, physical damage to the building. That was deemed to be a potentially significant effect and we have mitigation measures for construction that has to do I think with monitoring um, uh, whether or not there would be an adverse effect on the project and then acting accordingly if it was determined that the construction of the project would have an adverse effect on uh, the train station itself. Um, so I, question, question to that point, who, who deals with the issue of say construction is going on, you got the mitigation measures of course, but construction is going on, it's a sandstone building mm -hmm. and there's vibrations and so forth from the construction and all of a sudden you start having problems with the sandstone blocks cracking and it's a little bit like uh, you know my wife deals with uh, antique teacups and uh, you know once they're broken right the value just, yeah. it's gone yeah. <laughs> um, these are tough questions because I have not memorized the entire document um, the, the mitigation measure, I, I believe, is for studies to be done prior to construction to um, fully evaluate the integrity of the building. Um, then that's compared with the proposed construction techniques and there are models that can be used for um, whether or not vibratory effects are going to have, have an adverse effect on the building. Um, if that modeling determines that that's a potential, then there are methods that can be used to protect the building uh, prior to the start of construction. Um, you're correct. Um, there, we're not going to have um, somebody watching the building. They go, wait, wait a minute, you better stop. The, uh, the parapet just fell off the, the side of the building. Mm -hmm. you know, you're right. By then, it's too late. So um, this, this is a mitigation measure where the information is front and loaded prior to the start of construction. And who, who, so who's, in, who's put in charge of monitoring those? Um, is that on the city's back or is that on the contractor's back? Or? It's, it's the, the city has to monitor the project itself, but that will be in conjunction with the, the contractor and the project applicant. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a big issue. Um, and you talked about cumulative and you hit only on high speed rail. Mm -hmm. um, my concern was more with cumulative in regards to 
you know, we, we've got essentially three projects that are all, either the dirt's been moved already or we're talking about moving the dirt. Mm -hmm. Pamph, Wheeler, and this one. Mm -hmm. And as I spoke on Wheeler, I, I voted against the EIR on Wheeler because I felt like uh, when I asked the question, how far do you cast the net for impacts to the roadways in, the, in our infrastructure and so forth, the answer was, well, it doesn't go that far. It's too far from the project, and so we don't really look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, I can tell you already, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out if you're trying to come into San Carlos at 5.30 in the evening, um, you might have to sit through two or th three light changes before you get through mm -hmm. uh, Holly Street and El Camino. And like what happened to me the other day, I made it through the intersection, kind of. My rear end of my truck was hanging out on the El Camino because when I got across, there was a space for you to wait for the next light to turn. I couldn't get anywhere. Yeah. yeah, and even though the light was very green when I when I entered the intersection mm -hmm. and went across, I I couldn't go anywhere. Um, so we already have these these issues, and right. and I, that's what my concern is is looking at uh, the transportation circulation patterns mm -hmm. with all three as though all three projects were were built. Um, the reason I solely focused on the high-speed rail project was because that's the one that's most um, obvious being right next to this um, project itself. But um, the cumulative analysis is, is very um, uh, related to specific topics. You mentioned uh, traffic, and uh, Gary Black from Hexagon will speak to this when he gives his presentation. But um, the cumulative tra traffic analysis includes all projects that are currently under construction, as well as, I believe, the build out of the um, San Carlos general plan. So uh, traffic, in particular, does um, do a, a thorough evaluation of the cumulative uh, effects of the proposed project. Um, the, a number of study intersections were selected in consultation with the city on which of the intersections we might thought might be most affected by the proposed project. So those were evaluated. Those were first looked at um, for how they operate under existing conditions, then evaluated for how they would operate with the proposed project, and finally evaluated for how they would operate under the proposed project plus the cumulative scenario that I explained. The, the cumulative scenario that you explained then does include? It does include things like PAMF or other approved projects. Um, it, it, we, we try not to get too speculative, so usually it's approved projects or maybe um, projects for which an application has been filed and then also build out of the, the general plan. Hmm. Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah, just to tag along on that, I mean, can, do we have a specific answer from staff about whether or not Wheeler was included in this analysis? It's not an approved project, so. It, it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Deborah. It's a reasonably foreseeable project, and it also was in the um, general plan EIR build out analysis EIR. So, so, so it's it in was analyzed one. in the cumulative in impact. This one. Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And then the, uh, my last question is you, you talked about um, things that CEQA look at, uh, is also the um, guidelines or requirements of various agencies. Yes. And I was wondering if that included, for the city of San Carlos, we uh, years ago did a um, some visioning meetings and came up with design guidelines and design standards that, uh, for instance, to reduce visual impact require that buildings go back as they, as they step up, that the mm -hmm. upper floors step back. And quite frankly, uh, since we approved those, I've yet to see a building successfully done with those standards. Mm -hmm. um, primarily thinking of 1001 El Camino, which I don't want to see happen again in San Carlos. Um, so I'm wondering if, the, if those are, do, do those kind of standards also apply to CEQA or the, are they too considered too informal? Um, yes and no. And the reason I say yes is because we do have a, a land use section in the environmental document that looks at applicable plans and policies, but only those plans and policies adopted by the local jurisdiction in order to avoid or reduce um, environmental effects of a proposed project. So we, we, there is a table in the environmental document that includes all the policies that the city has adopted um, to, um, to protect the environment and then we've got a, a designation on whether or not the proposed project uh, is in compliance with those policies. 
So do those design guidelines tie into visual quality, or it sounds like they? Um, well, you know, the design guidelines, it's really up to the applicant to comply with those. Um, what we then look at is, um, is the project in compliance with those guidelines? And if not, would those then lead to an impact to the physical environment? So that's something that we would more apply to uh, the next step in the process of entitlement. Correct. Because that's what I'm hearing yes. you say. OK. All right. Thank you very much. You've been uh, very thorough. Okay. Appreciate it. Oh. Now, we've got uh, uh, Mr. Mulpey. We, we've got a, a short time here that we might be able to take a break. And then we've got, um, we haven't gotten to Gary Black and so forth. So we'll do that after we have our 218 hearing and that, so forth. That's correct, Mr. Mayor. And I would like to ask the city attorney to sort of weigh in here to properly segue us from one meeting to the next. To the so. other. OK, weigh in. OK, well, uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, we've, we intentionally noticed this meeting um, in, uh, in duplicate, if you will. We have the public hearing set at 5 o'clock on this special meeting agenda that we're just wrapping up right now. And we also put the exact identical notice of a public hearing in the regular agenda. Mm -hmm. So what you're really doing is um, continuing from, from this meeting to the regular meeting um, in order as agendized. So um, that's the step you're taking. So you're, you're basically, you don't need to take a motion. It's already been noticed in the next agenda. Um, but that's, in effect, what you're doing. OK, so we will take a break, and we will continue this public hearing during the course of our regular meeting uh, f scheduled at 7 o'clock. Let's take a, a little bit of a break here. I was looking ahead.